Good evening. I'm Rabbi Joshua Davidson, Senior Rabbi of New York City's Temple Emmanuel, a Reformed Jewish congregation offering an array of opportunities for members and non-members of all ages, from worship and tech study to programs on the arts and politics. Learn more about us in person or online at emmanuelnyc.org. On behalf of our Stryker Cultural Center, I'm honored to welcome the thousands of you joining us tonight. Anti-Semitism on the college campus and in the academy is not new. For years now, on campus quads, too many of Israel's detractors have conflated the Palestinian-Israeli conflict with other liberation struggles and implicated Israel's supporters in every societal injustice. And inside the lecture halls, even at the most elite institutions, intellectual dishonesty and political motivations often have colored the interpretation and teaching of history. Israel has been judged by double standards, and it has been demonized as a purely colonial enterprise and delegitimized as the historic homeland of the Jewish people, whose presence there stretches back at least 3,000 years. Even before October 7th, a concern existed at many colleges and universities for the safety of Jewish students. We already knew that a hateful obsession with Israel often descends into hatred of Jews. And then came Hamas's barbaric attack. If the shock and anguish of that moment were not already too much to bear, we witnessed in some corners of the academic world utter moral bankruptcy not just the defense of Hamas as freedom fighters, but a rejoicing in their atrocities. And on campuses, a rallying to their side, the hateful rhetoric defended on the grounds of free speech and free academic inquiry, as if the intimidation and fear felt by the Jewish community didn't undermine those very freedoms. In too many instances, university administrators have been weak in their response or are only now exercising the ethical leadership they should have six weeks ago. I've heard from Jewish students who feel isolated and alone. They describe an atmosphere of vicious bullying and physical intimidation. Some are afraid even to leave their dorms and just want to come home. According to recent testimony before the House Ways and Means Committee, anti-Semitic activity on campus has increased 700% from what was then a record level a year ago. And so the challenge, how do we address the crisis? How do we strengthen colleges and universities for the task? And how do we prepare and support our students? Tonight, six thinkers join us to address those questions and more. We begin with an individual whose powerful voice cut through the recent anti-Israel and anti-Semitic sentiment at Harvard encouraging others to speak out at other universities. Lawrence H. Summers is the Charles W. Eliot University Professor and President Emeritus at Harvard University. He served as the 71st Secretary of the Treasury for President Clinton and the Director of the National Economic Council for President Obama. We are honored by his presence. And he will be joined in conversation by Jeff Zucker, a fellow alum, the CEO of Redbird IMI and the former president of CNN Worldwide and CEO of NBC Universal, Mr. Zucker's legacy of bold, principled journalism is more important now than ever. Their discussion will be followed by a dialogue among four panelists a current college student, faculty member, Hillel rabbi, and dean, whom we will introduce before they speak. Now, please welcome Lawrence Summers and Jeff Zucker. Rabbi Davidson, thank you very much for that introduction. Larry, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I can't think of a a better voice to have to, to talk about this with. So thank you for being with us. Jeff, I wish we could be discussing a different subject, but I'm very glad to be uh, with you. I understand. So let's get right to it then. Um, and I just want to start with, you know, from your perspective, how bad is the issue of anti-Semitism on college campuses across America? I think we're at a moment of moral and mortal peril on college campuses and in the world much more globally. Because if history teaches anything, anti-Semitism doesn't end 
with Jewish people it ends in a much broader denigration of uh, freedom. And there are on many campuses a small number of people who are vicious anti-Semites by any conceivable definition. And there, but there are a much larger number of people who, in part because of callousness, in part because of ignorance, in part because anti-Semitism for thousands of years has had the, the way of mutating itself to attach to particular passions of the moment, who may not be anti-Semitic in their intent, but who are again and again in what they say and what they do, anti-Semitic in uh, their effect. I've been alarmed about anti-Semitism for almost two decades now. That's how long it's been since I spoke out uh, against the Divest Israel movement uh, at uh, Harvard. But even with that alarm, even with the alarm I saw when the student newspaper, the celebrated Harvard Crimson, um, editorialized passionately in favor of BDS, even with all of that, I have been surprised and horrified by what we are seeing on uh, college campuses. And I have to say, I have been disappointed as a general matter by the lack of strong response providing moral clarity. And 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 we'll get to that. And obviously you you uh you spoke about that almost right away. And 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 I want to get to that in a moment. But let me just follow up and say and ask you, what was the the anti-Semitism that you say you recognized two decades ago and that clearly has become so prevalent now? You know, was it always there, just b- b- below the surface? There's on, always on- been. Uh, yeah. There's always been some of this. Um, there has been an ability of anti-Semitic ideas to commingle themselves with unreflective um, anti-colonial um, ideas and come to justify the elimination of the Jewish state. If it's anti-Semitic to be against the, to be for the elimination of Jewish people, it's also anti-Semitic to be against, to be for the elimination of the only Jewish state. And there's been a lot of that under the surface and what happened has brought it to the surface. And maybe the most revealing thing of all is before a single Israeli soldier had done anything in Gaza, this had started. Before there was any attack, 35 student groups at Harvard, and look, not every student in those groups knew what was going on. Probably not everybody who headed those groups knew what was going on. But that 35 student groups could have said, could have come down clearly on the side of Hamas. That is got to be something that makes us all wonder what we've been teaching and what's been going on for a long time. Well, I I think everybody who's probably watching here, we're going to talk about uh, that statement that you just talked about and and what you said about it in a moment. But I think everybody who's, who's on this today probably believes in free speech, uh, no doubt. But how should universities like Harvard and others uh, balance that with uh, campus organizations and students that are chanting in support of Hamas and advocating, as you just said, for for the elimination of Israel? How, how do they how do we balance the free speech with that? Look, it's a big question, Jeff, and my answer here may not please everyone on uh, this call. I was horrified, appalled, and revolted when 40 years ago, the courts allowed the Nazis 
to march through Skokie. But I thought it was the right thing, given the First Amendment. And I don't think it's our place to ban speech unless that speech is putting people in imminent fear of physical danger. But I also think that academic freedom does not include freedom from criticism. It does not include freedom from repudiation. It does not include a right to have your speech supported with university uh, resources. And that the right response is a very strong condemnation of uh, speech, which demonizes Israel, speech which creates active dis- physical discomfort on the part of Israeli or Jewish uh, students. And I think that's what we need to look for from our leaders. But no, Jeff, as painful as it is, I don't think it's the right thing to shut down people's right to speak. And I think ultimately, if you try, you bring honor to the speech, you drive it to places where you can't see it. And I don't think uh, that is the right thing. I do think when your campus is being infiltrated with outside money, when student groups aren't disclosing the sources of their funding and they're problematic, that's the kind of situation where a responsible university administration has to act. But no, I don't think you should be banning speech just because its content is hateful. And I think one needs to remember that um, there were alumni groups, strong, well-connected alumni groups in the Ivy League who were determined to ban the teaching of Keynesian economics in the 1950s because they thought it was a Soviet plot. Their the record that Harvard has, and I think it's probably not very different in any major university, on uh, gay issues is uh, deplorable. So I, I think we need to speak. We need to set a tone of morality. We need to educate. But no, I, I don't think we can ban speech simply because we deem it prejudiced. Okay. Well, one of the things that's become clear uh, is that it's not just students uh, on these campuses who who harbor many of these beliefs and are endorsing Hamas's attack on Israel, uh, but it's professors and lecturers uh, uh, as well. And and there's been some very problematic examples of that. Students at UC Berkeley were offered extra credit to attend a walkout against Israel. A lecturer at Stanford instructed Jewish students to gather their belongings and stand in the corner because he said that's what Israel does to Palestinians. How how do universities get at the issues of their faculty, uh, some of them tenured, behaving despicably? So Jeff, you have to distinguish two different you have to distinguish two different things, I think. One question is what Professor Summers does in his classroom. And in his classroom, any manifestation of prejudice, any attempt to politically propagandize, any attempt to coerce is wrong, and Professor Summers should be subject to discipline if he does that. And that is absolutely clear. And frankly, uh, if I look at the records at my university and others, the response to racist acts in classrooms over many years has been very different from the response to anti-Semitic acts in classrooms. And that is something that should not be accepted. And it should be a stain on the honor of uh, those who permitted it. I think the case is different with respect to the separate speech 
outside of the classroom, outside of any administrative responsibility of faculty. And there, too, I think you are not free from criticism, but we cannot be in the position of repudiating uh, the ideas that we uh, that we have. But look, I want to say one other thing on these things. Those are my views. I'm pretty strong on free speech, but I'm even stronger on consistency. And any university has to have the same rules with respect to all kinds of prejudice. And if a university has far stronger approaches to what it perceives as racist or misogynist uh, acts, then it should have those same approaches with respect to anti-Semitism. So my view would be consistency as the first value, but I would favor a consistency that focused on tone setting rather than disciplining, except for people who are threatening people either with something physical or in the case of faculty or lecturers with the use of uh, their power. Well, well, so let's let's get at that and the consistency. And I think where where you may be headed is is let's talk a little bit about the responsibility of college presidents and and and, and frankly, you know, to take a position on this blatant anti-Semitism. What is so hard about that? What are they afraid of? Look, this is something that has upset me for a long time. There have been proposals to boycott Israel, to engage in academic boycotts, to not invite Israeli scholars, to not partner with Israeli institutions, to divest from the Israeli uh, economy for a long time. And it has bothered me very much that university leaders have resisted those ideas, but only on arguments that any kind of boycott is a bad idea, and never on the argument that the singling out of the only Jewish state for demonization, when there are clearly many other states that are committing the relevant sins to a much greater degree, constitutes something that is morally uh, problematic and redolent of uh, anti-Semitism. So I think it's a very, very uh, serious uh, problem. I also think that university presidents and university leaders and ultimately the trustees of universities have an obligation to protect the reputation of universities. And when others seek, as they often do, as, for example, the 35 student groups at Harvard did, when they speak in a way that suggests that it's not individuals speaking for themselves, but it's the university community or some important subset of the university community, then the people who have ultimate responsibility for the institution have an obligation to make clear that those people don't speak for the university and what those people are saying runs contrary to their own values and the values of the university uh, community. That is a crucial part of upholding academic freedom. And that's probably what was in your mind. I want to take you back now to something you uh, alluded to earlier. That's probably what was in your mind on October the 9th um, when you reacted to that letter that was released by the more than 35 Harvard student groups blaming Israel entirely, in their words, for the massacre two days earlier, you uh, took to Twitter and you blasted the, the Harvard administration for its silence uh, about the invasion and the statement of the student groups. Take me back to that day and 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 why you decided to, to do that. Uh, and And then what was the reaction to that? Jeff, as soon as I saw the statement, I was sick that here at this university I'd been part of for decades, 
You could have something holding itself out as a large part of the community. And I immediately communicated with the senior university administration that I felt that this was a moral imperative and that it was urgent that they make a statement. I didn't hear much back. And so I communicated that this was a major moral issue for me and that while my general approach as an ex-president was not to comment on what the current university administration was doing, I saw this as so much a moral issue that if they did not comment, I would uh, comment and comment strongly. And they didn't. And so I felt it was important to uh, send a clear message. And I have to say, Jeff, that I was surprised in one way by uh, the reaction. Um, I wasn't surprised, in all honesty, that a lot of people noticed. And I wasn't surprised, in all honesty, that a lot of people approved. What surprised me was the number of people who complimented me on my courage because I didn't feel I had anything really to lose. I was a tenured professor at the late stage of my career. What was anybody going to do to me? So I thought it was the right thing to do, but I did not think it was a remarkably courageous or particularly courageous thing to do. That so many other people felt that it was courageous, told me something about how nervous, apprehensive, and scared so many people uh, were. And that has led me to think that it is very, very important for those of us whose position is such that we're comfortable and able to speak out to continue to do so. Yeah. And I guess so I was also influenced by one other thing, Jeff. In a couple of years ago, the Harvard Crimson had an editorial that was beyond loathsome in its content, in the way it basically endorsed the elimination of Israel or rhetoric that certainly seemed to suggest the elimination of Israel as a Jewish state. And the administration responded only very mildly. And I addressed it, but I didn't address it as strongly as I wish I had, because I think if there had been more of a confrontation, then it might have made it possible for there to be a better discourse after October 7th. And so I felt that I'd learned from making that mistake in the past and it wasn't a mistake I would make again. Well, uh, for the record, I, I think uh, your courage uh, and moral leadership is is why there are so many people on this call today and why uh, so many people uh, are are so grateful for your leadership on this topic. I do want to just one follow up on the on what happened at Harvard, because some Harvard alums have su suggested that that the university's lack of any statement early on was uh, because the leadership at Harvard at that time was relatively new. Do you think that was the reason? I don't know. Um, the Harvard Corporation is made up of very experienced people. Okay. And the Harvard Corporation, if there was ever a moment of moral testing, it was this moment. And the corporation is made up of very senior people, and I don't think they can plead inexperience or innocence. They may not have known everything that was going on, but in some sense, at a moment of moral crisis, it is their job uh, to know uh, what is uh, go what is uh, going on. So. Look, I think this was a an event that was very much 
out of uh, the uh, the ordinary. And, you know, people make mistakes at moments uh, like that. I have to say the fact that it took six weeks before an appropriate statement uh, came, uh, came out and it came only after very protracted pressure was uh, quite uh, discouraging uh, to me. And Harvard has, and but I, but I don't want, and it would really be wrong because you and I are talking about Harvard to suggest that Harvard was somehow worse than other places. And, and, Harvard and, and, has a president who has said, has very clearly condemned the statement from the river to the sea. That is, to my knowledge, not true of any other Ivy League institution. And so I, I think that I want to give credit where credit is due. And yes, the responses were later than I would have preferred. And yes, there were things said that would not have been the things that I recommended. But uh, we also have to grade on a curve here. And Harvard has uh, recognized some very important uh, things um, at uh, this point and taken some very important steps. Okay. So look, we, we've gotten a lot of questions from people who are, who are watching. And I think, I think really what I want to do now is really talk about, okay, where do we go from here? What, what, what should universities do now? We've gotten a lot of questions from folks uh, who are with us today, um, who are all asking, uh, what more should university presidents uh, do? What should universities be doing? What what is the what is you know what is the road forward here? I think there are a few parts of uh, the answer to that question. I think they need to look at a variety of procedures around the way their DEI offices function and are issues of anti-Semitism treated in ways that are symmetric with other issues of prejudice. And the answer has often uh, been no. And they need to make sure that they're able uh, to uh, respond uh, to that. I think they need to provide moral clarity in the way in which uh, people speak. You know, there has not been a single suggestion, to my knowledge, even by the harshest of Israeli critics, that any Israeli engaged in sexual violence against anyone in Gaza. And yet that was a central part of the Hamas strategy. We have the videos and the recordings of people cheering, telling their parents with great pride what they had done to Israeli girls and Israeli women. Somehow in the way we speak and in the way we educate, we have to make it so clear to students that not everything has two sides. Sometimes there is moral clarity. Sometimes there is right and uh, wrong. And to understand nuance is not to say that there are always two sides. And I think that's a very deep thing in prevailing attitudes in uh, certain sectors of the academy. And it's the job of academic leaders uh, to lead in uh, moving uh, in in moving beyond that. You know, I was president of Harvard um, when 9-11 happened. And there was a question as to how we would talk about that. And there were some who would have used the same kind of language that they would have used if there had been a 
massive earthquake or a massive flood, the language of mass tragedy and sorrow. And there were others, and I was one of the others, who felt that it was crucial as educators to use words like prevail and evil in understanding the situation. And so I think the question of intellectual tone is, I think, a really a central responsibility, and it's something that needs to be contemplated. And I think this connects with um, what has been a concern for some time on college campuses, which is a lack of, for every bit of commitment to the diversity of representation on the campus, there has been no corresponding uh, commitment to the diversity of positions uh, in uh, the debate. And I think that is something that is very important uh, for us uh, to address uh, going, uh, for us for us to address uh, going uh, forward. I think there are a lot of questions about what are the values that are being imparted in an education that need to be uh, very carefully uh, considered. And I have to say, and you know, there are very thoughtful people who disagree with disagree with this, Jeff, but I think we have to think about what the role of universal values are versus the role of emphasizing many different identities, each with a perspective. And I think that's an important issue for us. Uh, in the Jewish community, do we want to be celebrating of universal values or do we want to be another identity group insisting on a set of identity groups for our th- our things? So my own view would be, yes, of course, there must be a uh, symmetry, but I would hope we could have more emphasis on universal values, universal American values, universal Western uh, values on uh, university campuses. So th- there's a, a number of things that you uh, went through there, and I'll, I'll try to try to get to some of them in a moment, including the diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and, the, uh, and the ideas of uh, diversity of thought on college campuses. So let me, let me come to each of those. But I want to talk about two things that, that are uh, uh, out there in terms of ways people are suggesting that some of this could also be dealt with. Um, first, I want to use the example from MIT, which reportedly did not want to punish uh, anti-Semitic foreign, foreign students who were harassing uh, American Jews on campus because suspending them might have led to deportation under student visa rules. And, you know, there's a lot of folks who are probably uh, want to say they should be deported. What do you say about that? I've tried to give you very straightforward answers. I don't know enough of the facts of that situation to say. I'll say this. Um, I have seen it happen when a student plagiarized something. That if the kid was an American kid, the kid was asked to take a year off of school because they had plagiarized something. And that would be a powerful punishment and and, uh, send a strong message. But when the kid was going to have to go home to a country where their life might be in danger because they'd lose their visa if they were suspended, the school made a different different, uh, decision. And so I can understand regarding deportment, uh, deportation, in a slightly different, uh, in a slightly different way. Okay. Well, l- let me ask you this: Should there be more pressure put on colleges under Title VI, uh, which prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in programs or activities that receive federal 
uh, financial assistance? Is it time for the federal government to back that up with actions? And isn't that one of the ways that college presidents would get the message? I, I, I saw that the federal government brought actions against seven schools, five, I think, for anti-Semitism and two for Islamophobia. And I'm not going to judge the merits of those legal actions, but I was glad to see the government doing that. My understanding is that there are rights of action that are not uh, governmental, but that can be brought by uh, in a civil way by parties. I think that's welcome. I think one of the things you learn over time, and Jeff, I suspect as a journalist, you've seen this more than I, is that sometimes what can be very important in, about lawsuits is that they enable discovery and that uh, sunlight is the best disinfected. So I don't want to judge the merits of any particular uh, lawsuit, but the notion of using lawsuits as a tool that seems appropriate uh, to me in the anti-Semitism area in the same way that it does in the racism area. Again, symmetry is a very important principle. Um, so I want to talk about something that, that's uh, garnered a lot of attention. What role do you think that alums and donors uh, should play from the outside? Do you think it helps for you know, Jewish donors to withhold money from these universities? When donors have asked me their view, what they what they should do, you know, I've said it's a personal choice for anybody, but that I think if I were in their position, I would strongly convey my disappointment and I would not make threats. And I say that because I think that if you strongly convey your disappointment, people will decide on their own that it's not a good time to ask you for a major gift. So you're not losing a lot. And I think that almost everybody, I'm sure you did it when you were running CNN, Jeff, reacts badly to threats. And it tends to get people's back up and therefore be uh, counterproductive. And I know if you think about university faculties, they they probably care more about the principle that they're not going to be pushed around by donors than they care about any particular principle in any of this. So I think it's a much better strategy to convey very strong disappointment to let that disappointment influence the decisions one uh, makes, but not uh, to uh, make uh, explicit threats. I also think it's very important to um, recognize, look, there's no, there's no perfect analogy between the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector. But there is a sense in which if the president of the university is like the CEO of the company, and if the trustees of the university are like the board of directors of uh, the company, the alumni who hold this degree that's very important to them and the reputation of the university is therefore central to them are a little bit like the shareholders of a company. And I think when there is a time of crisis and there is a sense that things are not being managed well, what shareholders do is communicate very strongly to the board of directors where there are opportunities, as there are in the Harvard governance system and most universities' governance system, for some alumni election of trustees, that mechanism is used. And so I think where alumni, I think the most effective thing for alumni to do is to convey the strength of their feeling to, uh, trust, uh, to trustees as well as to university leadership. And if I could give one more piece of advice, uh, 
I suspect the same is true for you, Jeff. But whenever I've been in a leadership position, I've usually been more influenced by six individual thoughtful letters than by one letter signed by 300 people. And so on these issues, we got a lot of mass letters flying all over the place. And I think a little bit more thoughtful communication would uh, probably uh, be helpful in advancing matters. Okay, so that, that's that's um, really interesting advice. Let me let me try to get some other advice from you uh, uh, for some folks who who might be thinking about going to college and applying to college uh, right now who who are watching this. We got we got a question in uh, from the audience from Catherine. Who, who asked, um, how can high school seniors engaged in the college admissions process gauge how comfortable or safe they might be on a particular campus? Should they look at the strength of campus organizations like Hillel, the presence of Chabad? What organizations like the Tikva Fund are good resources for students? How, how, should, how should they think about it uh, as they're applying to college? I think Chabad's and Hillel's have made an enormous contribution. What, what I told my kids and what I tell kids in general is if you want to get a feeling for whether you're going to be comfortable on a college campus, whether it's in the context of Jewish issues or in the context of anyone else, go up there without your parents, find a, find a friend from your high school or a friend from somewhere or a connection from somewhere and stay in a dorm for two days and follow the people around and just figure out how you feel in the community and ask a bunch of questions. And that's what I would advise. Uh, so I would advise uh, somebody to do. And I want to caution, look, I, I think I've been pretty clear in saying that these things are pretty serious. Life goes on. And if you, you know, I I spoke with one of the students today who has been most involved and most constructive uh, in pushing things um, along and in pushing issues that I think are very important at Harvard. And I asked him, what's life like? He said, look, you know, most days, you know, we're worried about our term papers and we're worried about our sports teams and we're worried about what we're going to do on Friday night. So I think it is also, there's also a tendency, and you know this from CNN, to glom on to the one event that makes the news rather than the thousand events that are not newsworthy. So I would say to uh, Catherine, find the college you like. Find some place where you feel like you'll be able to make friends and this is going to be OK. Okay, so you and I just have a few minutes left before we bring in uh, our panel. So I want to I want to try to uh, wrap this up with you uh, in, in a more macro sense and, uh, and and try to get your views on uh, something that you addressed, I think, in your first answer and really that, you know, obviously we're spending time here talking about what's going on on college campuses, but but we, we all know that universities do not exist in a vacuum. And young people today live in a culture of Twitter and TikTok and huge misinformation. So ultimately, you know, uh, are we facing just a, a university problem or is it a much deeper cultural one? Oh, I think it's a deep cultural problem, but I think that universities have a lot to do with deep uh, cultural problems and, deep, and solutions to deep uh, cultural problems. Isaiah Berlin famously said something like, nations fall because of ideas developed by professors in the quiet of their study. And if one thinks about ideas that move the world, they come out of 
uh, intellectual uh, communities. So I think the tone and attitude that is set in our universities is profoundly important. But Jeff, uh, make um, no mistake, uh, it is a very different world, I think, that we are headed into than the world I saw when I looked forward a decade ago. The What is coming out of Iran, what is coming out of Russia, what is coming out of China, what is at stake in elections in our country um, and in other countries is a profound challenge to the shared assumptions with which I operated through most of my career, that countries all wanted other countries to uh, do well and prosper together that democratic countries like the United States had orderly successions of uh, power, that one did not need uh, to fear uh, people on horse on uh, horseback, that major war was the stuff of uh, history. I'm still ultimately optimistic, but I don't see how you can be a thoughtful person looking at the world and not be, see substantially more of what the finance people would call tail risk than you did a decade ago. Well, let me just say that I think you've been very clear, uh, throughout your career, but particularly in the last six weeks and 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 here again tonight uh, on uh, this, uh, this time that we're in and the need for moral clarity and intellectual tone. Uh, and you've given us some other things that you think uh, campuses and, and university presidents should do. But uh, but there's no question that that moral clarity and, and the proper intellectual tone uh, are at the top of that list, and and few people have provided it as clearly over these last six weeks. And so I just want to say thank you for that, and I think I want to thank you on behalf of everybody who's uh, uh, watching here tonight uh, for actually taking all of this time to to share your views with us. And obviously, this is a very difficult time, and these are not easy issues. And uh, you have not shied away from. Uh, uh, what you think we're facing and what you think we should do. And so on behalf of everybody, uh, I just want to say thank you to you. Thank you for ha thank you for having me and thank you for to everyone who attended. And I think the number of people who are participating in this is maybe as clear a statement of any as to the degree of apprehension and to the degree of importance. Um, of these issues. So, Larry, thank you so much. And uh, we'll thank look you. forward to hearing more from you along the way. What we're going to do now is turn to uh, four other voices who, who are with us uh, tonight. And I'm going to uh, talk to each of them individually for just a few minutes, and then we're going to do it collectively. And I think you'll really be uh, uh, moved by by many of their individual stories. Let me, let me first uh, bring in Zoe Bernstein. Zoe is a senior at, at Cornell, uh, majoring in human development, and she is the president of the Cornelians for Israel. She is an alum of the Heschel School and SAR High School in the Bronx. Uh, she spent a gap year at the Shalom Hartman Institutes in Israel, and uh, her goal is to obtain her PhD in clinical psychology to work with adolescents battling trauma and anxiety disorders. Zoe, uh, thank you for uh, spending a few minutes with us tonight. Um, we're all uh, very grateful for that. And and let me let me uh, let, let me start by by asking you to tell us um, what you've experienced over these last six weeks at Cornell. Um, tell us about your experiences there. Uh, thank you, first and foremost, so much for having me. I'm very very appreciative of this opportunity. 
And I would say the past six weeks, definitely, it's been a progression of things. I believe things kind of started out a little bit more calmly and students were just kind of figure out how to process everything that we were seeing in the news and social media, hearing stories from friends and family um, over in the region. And from there, as things intensified, campus intensified too. And I would think that there's two different ways in which that went about. I would say there was the kind of the student perception and connections between peers, people talking to one another, seeing events on campus by student groups, um, which has been a little bit unsettling, whether it was kind of the ripping of hostage posters like we've really seen all over the world, student groups um, sharing sentiments on campus loudly and proudly um, that borderline were kind of anti-Semitic and made students really, really feel uncomfortable. But I would think my biggest problem and what's disheartened me the most out of anything is just really how much it's affected the classroom. I think that when things happen in the world at large, a college campus is kind of an incubator for processing them and digesting them and talking about them. But I don't think that that should happen at the expense of students' education. And that's kind of what I've been seeing and hearing from a lot of my friends and peers on campus that classes that have nothing to do with this topic, um, with what's happening in the war between Israel and Gaza, have kind of been hijacked um, for professors to really share their opinions where they're just irrelevant largely. And that, I think, has been really challenging to see. Um, just seeing my friends walk into class and have professors invite everyone to SJP rallies, saying that they'll be speaking there and would just love to see students there. And my friends who are supporting Israel and are seeing their families really just going through absolute nightmares, they just feel disenfranchised by those professors and feel like there's no room for their voice because they know how their professor feels and they know how their professor would respond to something that runs counter to that. So so, so you, you really have seen it. Uh, uh, what, what's really had the greatest impact on you, I mean, not you know that there's comparisons here but 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 in the classroom with professors and and that interaction has been uh something you didn't expect and really been the had the biggest impact on you I would say so. And like Dr. Summers mentioned earlier, that there absolutely is a lot of room for free speech on campus. And while that might make students uncomfortable, we do live in a country that celebrates free speech. And I think that that's something that should be valued and not forgotten. But what I think becomes problematic is when the classroom space is jeopardized and that students actually don't feel comfortable speaking their minds and grappling with these really, really challenging issues at risk of their grade being hurt and just not being accepted by their professors. These people who are supposed to be role models, supposed to be confidants, and now just really seem to alienate their students. Have you spoken up about this? Have you talked to university administrators about this? Yeah, so we've definitely been trying to. I and some of my peers have been trying to speak to as many people really as possible, just trying to get our voices out there, trying to stand up uh, for our peers and particularly the underclassmen, just because I really have had a largely great experience at Cornell and I wouldn't want it to become a place in with Jewish students and Muslim students too have been experiencing Islamophobia is what I'm hearing um, from some of my peers too, where it's a place where people like us just can't really fit in. Um, so we've been trying to say those things to the administration as best as possible and continue to over the coming weeks. And and how ha how do you feel the Cornell administration has been in response to all of this? And, and what do you think they should do going forward? I think that a lot of it has kind of been reactive instead of proactive thus far. And that's been pretty upsetting. That Kind of back to what uh, Professor Summers was talking about, the need to, to be in front. Exactly right. And I think it really took until we had a real threat, a credible threat on campus where a student was arrested um, for the administration to kind of take it seriously. But since then, they definitely have stepped up their game, which is very much appreciated. But I don't think that things happen in a vacuum. And I think because things people we're pushing the boundary since really October 7th, when the statement uh, initially that came out kind of conflated the horror atrocities in um, Israel with um, natural disasters. And because of that kind of set the tone and it allowed students to continue to push the boundaries until we really did have a student threatening Jewish students' lives on campus. And from that point on, I think things definitely shifted. But I would say going forward, something that I think would mean a lot to both Jewish and Muslim students alike is to implement anti-Semitism and Islamophobia training for freshmen the same way we have sexual assault training, the same way we have alcohol abuse training. Like this has proven to be something that is serious and should be taken seriously. And I think particularly college campuses, these institutions of higher education are the perfect opportunity. We care about education more than most other things. So why not use that value um, to kind of move things forward and make campus feel like a safer environment for all students again? 
Have you proposed that to the administration? I do plan on proposing that to, um, to the provost of the university after Thanksgiving. I'm planning to meet with him and I hope to share that. Okay. And let me just uh, end with you in this part right here. Um, I know that you, your great grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Um, so I know you were exposed to stories of, of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism uh, growing up. Um, did you ever imagine that, that, that there was something that you would personally be dealing with in this way now? Absolutely stage? not. Yeah, I would say that even my grandmother fled Hungary when she was nine years old um, to come to America where she thought she would provide a life for herself and for her family. And um, my great grandparents on the other side of my family as well, like everyone came to America, to New York specifically, because we felt as though this would be a new chapter and a new beginning. And it really is kind of destabilizing to be experiencing much of what they experienced just only less than a century ago, really. Yeah. Zoe, uh, um, thank you so much for for sharing uh, your experiences with us. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay with us uh, as I uh, and come back. I'll come back to you as we we talk as a group. But I I want to bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Shai uh, Davidai, uh, who is a member of the faculty uh, in the management division of Columbia University's business school. Um, and uh, uh, Shai, really thank you for uh, being with us. Um, for those uh, who didn't see the link, I want to note that um, you had a, a, a video that went viral um, uh, on October 18th uh, when you stood in the center of Columbia's campus uh, and delivered a uh, an incredible condemnation of Columbia's president, uh, as well as the presidents of other uh, academic institutions, for not speaking out against student groups uh, who support a terrorist organization and allowing anti-Semitism to fester. You called them cowards, uh, warning Jewish parents um, that their children uh, are not safe on campus. Uh, it's an incredible video, and I encourage anyone who hasn't seen it uh, to watch it. What compelled you to, to take such a, a bold action, um, frankly, probably at the risk of your own job? Um, tell us about that. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'll correct one minor thing in the question. I did not warn Jewish parents. I warned every parent. This is not a Jewish problem. Um, and I also want to say, I'm going to do the Jewish thing and answer a different question first. I hope it's okay with you. Um, because, you know, I, I have deep respect for Dr. Summers, but I also uh, have something that I disagree with. Okay. Uh, Dr. Summers says, um, this is going to be okay. This is not going to be okay unless we make it okay. Because we as a people have said already in the 1930s, this is going to be okay. Let's not wait until it's not okay and also too late to, to, to act. And I disagree with, with Dr. Summers when, when he said, tells people to convey your strong disappointment. Right? Convey, and that, you know, that's a literal, that's what he said, convey your strong disappointment. We have been conveying our strong disappointment for years. We should not use our words anymore. We should use our checks. We should use our feet. We should use our actions, which means, you know, you have disposable income. You want to make the best. You want to make the world a better place. Give it to where you can make the biggest impact. Give it to hospitals. Give it to, to, uh, to, to, uh, communities that are underprivileged. Right now, when you are giving your money, if, if it's $1, $50, or $50 million to any of these universities, what you're doing is that you're helping them stay afloat while they are helping the SJP stay afloat. These organizations that are calling, some Israeli, that are calling for the eradication of my four-year-old niece and my 93-year-old grandmother to Basically, we're calling for their extermination. They are receiving money from the university. So every time you write a check to your alma mater, you want to ask yourself, how much of your own hard-earned money is going to the SJP and the JVP? So I think that's an important thing. There's a big question of, of donors. Um, what compelled me? Moral bankruptcy. You know, if, if you watch the video, um, I, I introduce myself as a Jewish Israeli professor, but I talk as a dad. 
I have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. Right. And when the university allows these pro-Hamas organizations to celebrate the, the, the murdering, the execution of two-year-old babies and calling them a legitimate target of resistance, they are calling my daughter, a daughter of, the univer- of, of an employee of the university, as a legitimate target. And the fact that they are unable, the leadership of Columbia University and other universities, to come and say, no, we respect free speech, but we do not fetishize free speech. The, the fact that they are unable to do that is heartbreaking for them. Well, well this, is, this is the lack of moral clarity uh, that Dr. Summers spoke about uh, and, and, and the absence of that. Did you hear from anybody uh, with the university after your, after your video went viral? Have you heard? I haven't heard anything. They, you know, the university has shown us, not just me, us again and again, that they do not care about Jewish lives and Israeli lives, right? In the name of free speech, they allow these student organizations to completely devalue Jewish lives. Now, it should be noted, I believe in free speech for students, but we're talking about student organizations that are getting money, for getting space, for getting a platform and a microphone from the university. And we should we should make the distinction. Most of these organizations, most of the students that go to these rallies, I believe that deep down in their hearts are good people that have been hijacked by the radicalized extremists that are maybe 15 to 20 percent that are the organizers. And and I also want to note one thing that's extremely important, because I think Dr. Summers made a great distinction between what professors do in class and what they do outside of class. But universities have acted quite clearly about what professors do outside of class as well. Right. Uh, last year, the head of the psychiatry, uh, the chair of the psychiatry department at Columbia uh, University made a horrible racist remark online on his own social media account, and he immediately faced repercussions. I do not understand why when a professor of history calls the raping of teenage girls as awesome just because they're Israeli, he cannot face the same repercussions. Or why a professor at Cornell that says he was exhilarated by October 7th, why he can't face repercussions. I, I, I agree with Dr. Summers about the symmetry, I am not asking for special treatment. I'm just asking for equal treatment. And that's it. Dr. Davidai, uh, um, thank you for this. Stand by. Stay with us. I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I want to bring in now Rabbi Isabel de, de Koenig. Uh, she's the executive director and campus rabbi for Hillel at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Rabbi, good evening, and thank you for being with us. Um, and perhaps... Perhaps we can start by you telling us a little bit about what's been going on at Drexel. Sure. Uh, Drexel is a little bit different than some of the campuses that we've been talking about. And I think um, that difference is actually pretty important. Um, so for those who don't know, Drexel is a large uh, private institution uh, in, in the city of Philadelphia, uh, about 15,000 undergraduate students, about 900 Jewish undergraduate students. Uh, and since October 7th, um, on the on the one hand, um, we've had a, an enormously supportive uh, administrative response, um, both initially to the attacks um, and then subsequently um, to what has unfortunately been kind of a cascading experience of anti-Semitism on campus, largely in the form of explicit anti-Semitic graffiti, um, pretty significant vandalism, uh, and then, you know, similar to what Zoe described, protests on campus. Um, and importantly, um, the climate that we have now on campus, which I think is largely mirrored uh, many campuses across the country, is one where students report 
a number of conflicts with with their own roommates, whether they're first year students living with people who they didn't choose or even upperclassmen who didn't realize that there were going to be these kinds of divides between them and and their chosen roommates. Um, We have student leaders who are experiencing um, what one might generously call intense jockeying, what others might call bullying um, from other student leaders. We see that also amongst our faculty uh, so that there's just an energy of Frustration um, and disengagement from campus faculty, uh, Jewish faculty have reported just kind of not wanting to engage with their peers, coming to cl- campus, teaching classes, leaving. Um, and then broadly, feelings of isolation, loneliness, anxiety, fear uh, on the part of uh, both students and faculty, um, you know, in an environment where mental health crisis was already uh, running high amongst college uh, college students um, this War, the attacks, and then the war have really, I think, pushed students to to the breaking point um, and are, are clamoring for a sense of belonging and, and kind of feel cut off from that uh, in, in almost every avenue, um, out, you know, outside of insular places like within the Jewish community. And and what would you say has the reaction to all of that been by the Drexel administration, and and have they brought you in uh, to their to their decision making on all of this? Sure. And and this is where I really think um, things get. I I think what I I, I have to offer is going to end up being a little bit complicating for folks, um, because I wish I could say the challenge is with the administration and they're not doing enough. And that's why there's anti-Semitism on campus. The reality on our campus um, is that we have an enormously responsive administration who have sent not only myriad, uh, you know, emails to the entire Drexel community, which have been you know, very clear in their condemnation of Hamas, very clear in their condemnation of anti-Semitism on campus, um, and have really led and managed through this situation with that kind of energy. Um and yet still we're experiencing all of this on campus. I've worked closely with the senior administration at Drexel for the last 13 years um, since I've been there. Um, it is a matter of, of practice on our campus when there are um, issues relating to the Jewish community and our, our our safety on campus, our voice on campus, that I'm a part of those conversations in a consultative way. Um, And that's what makes this particularly hard is that um, it would be a lot easier if we could point and say, well, at a campus where the administration is great and they talk to the Jewish leaders on campus, everything is wonderful and fine. Um, But even on a campus like that, all of that is necessary for our students, but it's not sufficient. Um, And in part, it's not sufficient because no amount of leadership and management uh, from a university kind of at that level, you know, where we're talking about triaging emergent situations uh, is going to be sufficient, a sufficient replacement for the lack of cross-cultural competency that our students are coming to campus with that, quite frankly, many of our faculty have. Um, And it's not going to be a replacement for teaching our students and our faculty to engage across really difficult differences Uh, not only with passion, but also with compassion. And if we're not doing any of those things, um, you know, there's there's sort of no amount of emergent treatment that is going to make campus any better or safer for our students. So uh, as a rabbi, I want to I feel I want to ask you, has what's happened on on campus the last six weeks? um, You obviously interact with students, uh, I'm sure, on a regular basis. Do you think that that what has happened uh, the last six weeks has has in any way changed uh, their relationship uh, with Judaism? I think that it's confirmed the places where Jewish life is needed the most uh, by students on campus. Um, I'm sure that, Jeff, that you know, um, and men- many other folks know parents who will say to their kids when they go off to college, I don't care whether you go to Hillel or Chabad or whatever. I just want to know that there's one there for you, you know, if if you should need. Um, so we're in one of those moments of if you should need. Um, and it turns out that I think for a lot of our students, they're realizing that they actually needed also before, um, that they maybe didn't connect the sense of isolation, the lack of a sense of kind of belonging writ large uh, that the digital world has provided them with um, the lack of certainty that the the moment we're living in, not just acutely with this war, um, but really more broadly with the 
manifold crises in our world. Um, I think that they students have increasingly come to realize the the numerous benefits to being connected to Jewish life, not only to religious practice, but community, tradition, culture, and I think most importantly, having adult mentors on campus uh, who with whom to have difficult conversations about what's going on with their peers, strategize about campus leadership, about who they want to become in college and and not just what they're there to study. Well, they're certainly lucky to have you uh, there as as someone to, to play that role. Um, let me let me uh, bring our, our final guest in. We'll come back to you, obviously, in a moment. Let me let me introduce now uh, Erwin Chemerinsky. Uh, Erwin is widely considered uh, America's most influential uh, legal educator. He became the dean of the Berkeley Law School in 2017, after almost a decade as the founding dean at the University of California Irvine School of Law. He's also taught at Duke, the University of Southern California, DePaul, and UCLA. Erwin, it's uh, really nice to see you, and thank you for for joining us tonight. Uh, It's an honor and pleasure to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, In a recent uh, op-ed in in the Los Angeles Times, you wrote about the situation at Berkeley and how you've been the you yourself have been the target of anti-Semitism. Can you tell us about that and what's gone on? Sure. What I said there is I'm a 70 year old Jewish man and I've never felt or seen the anti-Semitism over the last couple of months. Let me just relate some incidents. On October 8th, our law students for justice in Palestine issued a statement celebrating what Hamas had done and regarded it as an effort at liberation. On October 9th, I put out a statement to the law school that began that I was horrified by the terrorist attack in Israel. It continued that we should express compassion for all in danger and we're in all the loss of life in the Middle East. I then talked about why we as a law school need to be a place where all ideas can be expressed and that we're making available mental health services for our students. That was immediately condemned as, quote, racist, and Islamophobic, because I called it a terrorist act. On October 11th, I was doing a town hall for students that had been scheduled months earlier. And one of the things the student said to me was that she felt unsafe in the law school. And I said, what made you feel unsafe? What can we do to make you feel safe? And she said, quote, get rid of the Zionists here. I certainly have to say I and the other Jewish students in the room felt that it was saying, get rid of the Jews here. Um, On October 27th, which was what actually precipitated the op-ed, some of our students put on Instagram a picture of me in combat makeup saying, Erwin Chemerinsky has taken an indefinite leave of absence as dean to join the IDF. A number of students objected that I was part of a, quote, Zionist conspiracy, and hearing that just brought to mind such age-old anti-Semitic tropes. Those are just a few things in a very short amount of time. Incredible. Um, and, and you wrote in there uh, forcefully, when do we stop being silent? Uh, which immediately conjured up images uh, of the reactions of many European Jews uh, as the Nazis rose to power. Um, talk to me about that and about when do we stop being silent? In the days after October 7th, I was surprised to see few campus administrators speak out. And so when students for justice in Palestine across the country, when there were professors across the country celebrating what Hamas did, I was surprised to see that campus officials were silent. And my point was that we can't be silent. It's so important that we condemn anti-Semitism when it's there and that we condemn Islamophobia. Condemning anti-Semitism is in no way ignoring the problem of Islamophobia. Condemning anti-Semitism isn't in any way disparaging rights for Palestinians. It can't be an either-or situation. Right. Well, in fact, uh, as Dr. Summers spoke about earlier, the, you know, the, 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 the need for moral clarity uh, is, I think, one of the great things that's missing across our college campuses now. Why do you think so many leaders on college campuses don't have the courage? It's not that hard to say what Hamas did was barbaric. Why Why is there that lack of courage? I think that the campus administrators who were silent were afraid that if they spoke up, they'd be called Islamophobic or anti-Palestinian. And so it's easier for them at that moment to be silent. But I think what's so crucial is that silence is a message too. And one of the things that any university president or dean has to realize is, when is my silence the message I don't want to communicate? And those are the times we have to speak up. And I wrote the op-ed to say, 
it's so crucial that campus administrators now do speak up against anti-Semitism as well as Islamophobia. Right. All right. So, Erwin, let, let, let me bring everybody on the panel back in and ask Zoe and Rabbi DeConnick and, and, and Shai to come back in. So thank you for that. So now, you know, we, we've been listening to each other and and we heard uh, Larry Summers speak. And so we've been talking uh, for, you know, a little more than an hour. I think the question that I'd like to do in the final 15 minutes is just have a conversation uh, among us about, you know, what do we do now and where do we where do we go from here and 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 how do we really uh uh deal with this and so zoe let me bring you back in first and you know you've heard everybody's stories here and you're 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 the only student uh, uh on a campus right now that we're talking to um what have you heard tonight in terms of what you think is important going forward uh especially for everybody who's listening here you know what can we do about this it's a great question. Uh, definitely one that takes a lot of thought, but I would say honestly that we need to just work with as many people as they're willing to work with, because I think that there's just so much hate right now. And just trying to bridge some of these divides is just really, really necessary at this point. And just reaching out to anyone that seems interested in kind of partnering with us, because it's just so hard to be alone. And I think so many students on campus just really feel isolated and that they've lost a lot of their support networks because some people just don't want to be friends with a Zionist anymore. And that's a really, really hard thing to process. But then anyone that does, I think we just need to find community with one another. And I know at Cornell, the Jewish community has been strengthened beyond belief since October 7th. And we've all really just come together and any divides that existed within our community before just kind of fell to the wayside. I think people really do crave unity right now. And I think just presenting a united front um, always is really, really valuable. Rabbi, that's what you were talking about a little bit about the need for community and 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 finding that Hillel or Chabad or whatever it took or that mentor. I mean, I think that's what Zoe's talking about as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a crisis on campus and really not just for Jewish students around belonging. And, and Zoe spoke to this a little bit earlier as well. But if you know, if you talk to Muslim students on campus or Palestinian students on campus, they will report very specific in different ways, very similar feelings of isolation, um, abandonment by, you know, it, they might feel abandoned by if they if there are it, it's administrators who are coming out very strongly condemning Hamas, they might feel abandoned by administrators, whereas, you know, students who are on those campuses might feel abandoned by their peers um, or, you know, it's kind of a mix around faculty. But we have campuses where people are feeling just so broken and alone. Um, and then when we pile on the stress of war, our capacity to treat each other with compassion and kindness and curiosity is utterly lost. Um, and it becomes very difficult um, to actually look in the face of somebody else in your classroom and see them as a brother, as a sister, as a parent, as a, a sibling, um, as someone who has um, possible, you know, the possibility for compassion. And, and I think that exactly as Zoe said, it's about reaching to others. Um, and it's also about finding one's own voice um, and being able to reach across where we can, um, but not allow ourselves to be erased um, and made so small as to become invisible. Um, Shai, Sh why don't you jump in here? Because obviously I think, you know, you feel very passionate uh, on this topic. And, and I'm just curious what you think, uh, what you think you've heard tonight and, and what you think the path forward is. I have a clear path forward. Um, okay. Okay. I think every university, if it wants to keep calling itself an institute of higher education, rather than just an institute of higher training, right? Education is like treating the whole person. It must take a moral stand. I don't think what we're seeing is lack of moral clarity. I think it's deeper. It's moral bankruptcy. It's not an inaction because, it, like you said, the silence is the action. And they must condemn any act of terror, regardless of who the victim is. And they must, must remove any organization that, that celebrates terror from campus. Again, it doesn't matter who it is. And my biggest... 
problem right now, my biggest issue is that this is treated as a Jewish problem. I do not understand why the big non-Jewish donors, why the, why the trustees of all these universities are not standing up and saying, now's the time. If we do better or get out. And that's what I think. I think we should all create pressure on these big actors that are non-Jewish to realize that this is about morality. This has nothing to do with Israel. It has nothing to do with, um, with Judaism. I mean, I want to make something clear. I'm not saying threaten universities with not giving money. I'm saying just don't give money. It's not about a threat. And, you know, and if you still want to give money, you say you can earmark it to specific things like a center for studies of yeah. anti-Semitism. Erwin, let me bring you in. What's your reaction? Sure. Let me say, I think campuses need to do four things. First, yeah. they need to condemn anti-Semitism and Islamophobia when it's expressed. Campus officials can't be silent. Second, if there's action that's beyond the scope of the First Amendment, then they need to punish that action. I'm at a public university. We can't prohibit students from expressing views that I find hor horrible. They have the right to express it. But if they cross the line from speech to action, if they violate campus rules, then that's a different situation. Third, we have to create educational programs. We are educational institutions. One of the things that I've learned is how little my students are aware of the history of the Middle East. I remember in early November, talking to a group of students and saying, this, this was the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration that Britain had announced in 1917 that there should be a Jewish state where Palestine, where Israel now is. None of the students I was talking to had ever heard of the Balfour Declaration. That's our fault as an educational institution. And finally, we've got to provide support for our Jewish students, our Palestinian students, I think for our Jewish students, things like Hillel's and Chabad's are important. Creating organizations like we have a Jewish Law Student Association is crucial to provide support. And that has to include also campuses need to provide mental health and emotional support for our students. Okay. So um, just before we begin to wrap this up, I want to uh, ask uh, Larry Summers, uh, who's been listening to all of this. Larry, um, if you'll if you'll come back in uh, and give us some give us some of your final thoughts uh, as we wrap this up tonight. This has been an extraordinarily uh, thoughtful conversation. I learned an enormous amount from all four uh, panelists. I think that Irwin uh, had a good list of issues for uh, university leaders. I want to just emphasize that this is not only an issue for Jewish people. Where there is pervasive anti-Semitism, always what follows is violence, what follows is intolerance, what follows is totalitarianism, um, and what is at stake in this struggle is not a parochial interest of those of us who are Jewish, but a struggle to define the kind of world that we want uh, to live in. And it is that perspective that universities need uh, to be pushed uh, to bring if uh, we are going to succeed in establishing the kinds of uh, institute, the kinds of institutions that we want uh, to be, and it is for us to take the high road, not to take a road of this group got it, so we need ours. Of course, there needs to be symmetry, but above all, there needs to be tolerance and respect uh, towards all, resistance to violence as a way of mediating uh, conflict, and insistence on the tradition of liberal debate. 
Those would be profound issues for American universities, even if there was no anti-Semitism uh, problem. And so I hope that we can always, as we press our argument and insist on what is right, can link it to these broader challenges, which I think are immensely important for the future of our country and the future of our world. Thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, Larry, let me just say uh, thank you to you for for spending this evening with us and to each of our pa panelists, uh, Zoe and Erwin and uh, Shai and uh, and Rabbi DeKonink, uh, uh, your willingness to share your stories and, and what you've experienced and and how you're uh, attempting to deal with all of this gives us uh, great hope. And uh, at this very difficult time, uh, and so on behalf of, I know, Rabbi Davidson, who opened this uh, event tonight and everybody at the Stryker Center, I want to thank you for uh, spending your evening with us. And, and I want to wish each of you uh, well uh, in the uh, in the days and weeks and months ahead. And uh, and and thank you all for being with us. And I want to thank everybody uh, who, who signed up and watch tonight and 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 spent your time and gave us your time thank you for being with us we're very grateful uh and a very good night to you